Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining the World Affairs Council of Philadelphia, either in person or online, for tonight's meaningful event of the Sattel Family Foundation DiploChat series. The World Affairs Council is exceptionally good at two things. First, educating middle and high school students about global uh, perspectives and cross-cultural skills in a nonpartisan way. And second, providing great adult educational opportunities to meet, hear, and to personally question leading government officials in the United States and other countries in the news. My name is Ed Sattel, and I have had the pleasure of being involved with the council as a supporter and as a board member for more than 25 years. In all those years, what I have found to be most unique and most valuable about the council events is the real educational access these programs provide to Philadelphians and guests from other parts of the country so that thought leaders, policymakers, and tonight diplomats who help shape our world. That access to hear and question is vital for an informed citizen, right? And has never been more important or impactful than now. That is why I'm thrilled this series presenting outstanding and international diplomats to Philadelphia is named for the Sattel Family Foundation. And with that, I will turn it over to my good friend, council president and CEO, Lauren Schwartz. Thank you to Ed. Uh, he's not with us tonight. I believe he's in Florida, like we all might wish we are with this uh, Philadelphia late uh, spring cold weather. But thanks to Ed and the Sattel Family Foundation for helping making this series possible where we bring diplomats to Philadelphia for direct conversation. The conversation tonight is yours and it's ours collectively. Council General Melander will make opening remarks and then we'll, it's open call for questions from our virtual audience and our audience in the room. This is a format that we do quite often, and I hope that you enjoy it tonight. We had Australia last month and Israel next month, and lots more of these to come. I'd also like to thank our partners for, with, with excuse me, our partners on this event tonight, the American Swedish Historical Museum right here in Philadelphia, as well as the Swedish American Chamber of Commerce. We've worked with them to help make sure that anybody who's interested in this topic has access to this opportunity. And they are champions of the connections between Sweden and Philadelphia, which go hundreds and hundreds of years back. Not everybody knows that Delaware was once called New Sweden. And Swedes actually settled this part of the country first. Now I'm from Minnesota, and one of the best ways to get into an argument over Thanksgiving dinner is to tell them that Sweden has closer connections to this part of the country than we do up in Minnesota. But it does happen to be true. And even if you look at the flag of the city of Philadelphia, which is hiding behind the corner here, it's the colors of Sweden. And when you look at our Philadelphia City Hall, on the top of the building, there are statues of Swedish immigrants and Swedish pilgrims who came here first. So our ties are long and strong, which is part of why we're so grateful to have our representatives from the Consul General of Sweden in New York here with us tonight. In addition to Consul General Millender, we've got Deputy Consul General Annetta Nilsson Exner, who's here with us tonight as well, and I encourage you to connect with them both. I should say I'm also wearing two hats tonight. In addition to serving as the CEO and President of the World Affairs Council, I'm also the Honorary Consul of Sweden for Pennsylvania. So I'm like their satellite office, boots on the ground, heels on the ground sometimes, um, to make sure that the connections between Sweden and Philadelphia and the whole state of Pennsylvania are as strong as possible. One of the things we talk about here at the council is how critical world affairs is. That's no surprise. It goes without saying it's in our name. But for 70 years, we've been a nonpartisan nonprofit connecting Philadelphia to the world through youth education, through conversation programs like this, through professional development and travel. And boy, does that feel really important right now in this moment that our world was in. We've been saying that for a number of years, COVID being a global crisis, climate, and now of course the challenges and war that we see in Ukraine with Russia. This access and conversation is critical to better understand the world around us. So thank you for joining us and for being a part of the World Affairs Council conversations. 
A bit of housekeeping today, this program is hybrid. So hello to everyone on Zoom and hello to everyone in the audience. Um, we will have some opening remarks from Consul General Melander, and then we'll move into audience question and answer. If you're on Zoom, use the Q&A feature to type in your questions and we'll facilitate those as well as questions from the room just when you raise your hand. If you're in the room, please wait for a microphone and that will allow everybody online to hear the conversation that's happening here. So I'll help facilitate that. Of course, we're on social media as well, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, all of those things. Feel free to shout out about your experience to share your ideas and thoughts with us on social media. You can also access the digital program booklet using QR codes in the office to get a little bit more background on tonight's program. In terms of health and safety, masks are optional at this point in the city of Philadelphia with our following our public health guidance at the local and at the national level. So masks are optional and we appreciate you doing everything we can to continue to stay safe together. With that, I'm excited to introduce Consul General Melander. She took her position in New York in September of 2021. Yet she's got 20 years of experience as a diplomat within the Swedish government and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Consul General Melander has extensive experience in trade, business, and promotion of Sweden all around the world. She served as the ambassador to Vietnam from 2012 through 2016, where she told me today she ate every single kind of Vietnamese, Vietnamese food possible. So if you have questions about that, we can go there too. And she held various posts across the US, ranging from Buffalo all the way down to Texas. So I suppose we could talk about Buffalo wings and Texas wings and all kinds of other things if the conversation gets a little heavy. Uh, in addition to that experience, of course, back home in Sweden, she spent time on Middle East issues, been posted in Israel, and of course, worked extensively within the EU-Sweden relationship. Council General, thank you for joining us tonight. I invite you to the podium for opening remarks, followed by our discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lauren, uh, for that introduction. And I'm just so impressed to see that there are so many people on a rainy Wednesday. Uh, who would have thought? <laughs> uh, I, let me just say that I, if I start coughing, you don't have to be afraid. I have a little bit of a, uh, a cold, uh, but I made a PCR test and it came out negative. So just so you know, so you don't have to be afraid. Well, uh, I'm so happy to be here uh, as the Consulate General in New York. We cover um, New York, of course, but all of New England. And uh, since we have an honorary consulate here headed by Lauren, uh, this was one of my things on my wish list to come here. And we've had a wonderful program here today. So thank you so much, Lauren. Uh, let me say a few words about the relationship between Sweden and the US. As you were saying, Lauren, we go a long way back, 400 years, uh, and in 1638, two Swedish vessels came to Delaware, uh, and that became New Sweden. And actually, I'm very excited because tomorrow we're going to go and see the repli replica of one of those ships. It's called Kalmar Nickel, Kalmar Nickel. And I met some of these people in, uh, in Stockholm at the reception at the Vasa Museum. And I saw a, a film about the ship. So I'm very interested to see now the, the, uh, the ship in, in real life. Um, uh, well, Sweden was very early in, in recognizing the US as an independent nation. And that was already in 1783, which was uh, uh, following the Revolutionary War. And we established diplomatic relations in 1818. Uh, and a lot of Swedes emigrated from Sweden to the US. 1.3 million Swedes emigrated. And that was actually a third of the Swedish population at that time. And why did we emigrate? It was because of famine and poverty. And most of the Swedes you will find in the Minnesota area, uh, but, um, but also here in Pennsylvania and, and in Jamestown and, and uh, yeah. Uh, and, I was told that 3.8 million Americans actually have Swedish descent. So I think that's quite a large number. Um, there are some Swedish companies or companies in, in the US that were, were uh, founded by Swedes, Walgren's, you might know, <laughs> and Nordstrom's, Greyhound. Uh, and uh, what you might not know is that Sweden is the 15th largest investor in the US. 
This is a country of 10.5 million people. I think it's quite an impressive number to be the 15th, 15th largest investor in the US. And Swedish companies here in the US actually create no less than 360,000 jobs. <clears throat> and a lot of companies have been on the uh, on the uh, US market for a large number of years. Ericsson has been here for 120 years. Electrolux opened its first factory in uh, 1931. Skanska arrived much later in 1970, um, um, but, but has made a large uh, footprint here in, in the US. Um, and IKEA, I know, has its headquarters in Philadelphia, and it has more than 50 stores. You might have heard of Volvo, uh, Spotify, Skype, H&M, Securitas, AstraZeneca, Saab, and ABB, and all of these companies have large operations here in, in the US. Um, and Sweden is a small country, but we are very globally connected. Uh, we are the third largest country in the European Union. Uh, and our borders have been unchanged in, since 1905. That's when uh, Nor Norway decided they did not want to be in a union with Sweden anymore. It was a very peaceful breakup of that union. We also lost Finland in 1809. And um, we have not been at war since uh, 1814. That was actually a very brief and short war with Norway, but it means that we have not been to war for over 200 years. Um, exports account for almost half of Sweden's GDP. Uh, this is an enormously large uh, amount of, of our GDP that comes from exports. We have always been trading um, and we're a strong supporter of free trade, a very strong supporter of free trade. Uh, our economy is very internationally integrated. Um, and what do we export then? Well, machinery, transport equipment, cars, uh, pharmaceuticals, um, electronics, and telecommunication. And the European Union is our most important trade partner, but our second most important is the US. <clears throat> uh, and um, um, our system is a capitalist system, uh, and it's a knowledge-based economy. And as I said, it's very well, well integrated into the global value chains. Uh, Sweden's wealth comes from innovation. Uh, we have always been very strong when it comes to innovation. Um, it started out with such things as ball bearings, which you have in all wheels to make them spin, the safety match, Bluetooth, which you have in all your phones, three-point seat belts. It's, we're very safety oriented country. The ultrasound comes from Sweden, the ECG, the pacemaker, we're always been big when it comes to the medical sector. And you all probably are wearing something that is actually a Swedish invention, the zipper. Yeah. Um, and I would say most of our multinational companies have sprung out of innovations. Uh, Ericsson, SKF, Atlas Copco, IKEA, ABB. Um, and we do allocate quite a large amount of our GDP to research. 3.5% of our GDP is, an, is allocated annually to research. And this is on par with countries such as Israel, Switzerland, Japan, and South Korea. And the Nobel Prize is an example of Sweden's longstanding commitment to excellence in research. It's uh, broadly considered to be the most prestigious uh, award in the world. And more than 380 Americans have been awarded the Nobel Prize. It's much more than any other nationality. And I think that is a proof of the excellence of, this, of the American universities. We're very strong when it comes to entrepreneurship. Um, it's, uh, it, it's something that is very much encouraged. Uh, and we've had a number of startups that have become what we call unicorns. Uh, Spotify, Minecraft, Skype, King, Mojang, Evolution Gaming, and Klarna are all startups that are now valued at over 1 billion uh, uh, US dollars. And why are we so strong in entrepreneurship? I think it's in part because of our country's social stability is also access to government support. Uh, but we have a very skilled workforce and low corporate taxes. Actually, they are at 21%, which is the corporate tax in the US. 
uh, uh, and uh, people are not afraid of failing. If you're going to be an entrepreneur, you have to be prepared to fail because you might not have the perfect solution from the outset. So there is no social stigma in failing. If you fail, fail fast, and then you start all, all over again. And since we have a quite um, a broad social security net, it means that you will not have to leave your apartment or your house if you would, if if you if you don't make it on your first attempt. You will you will uh, come around and you will try again. Something which I think is really encouraging is to see that all Swedish companies are really committed to the green transition. Um, it, you will not find one Swedish company that is not in some way trying to reduce their carbon footprint. And uh, for them, it's a matter of survival because if they don't go green now, they will not survive the steep competition on the world markets. And in Sweden, I think we are not only talking about reducing our CO2 footprint, we are actually living the change. Since many, many years back, we have been recycling uh, plastic, metal, batteries. Um, and we've been taking care of our food waste, transforming it into biogas. So actually in Sweden, our buses run on biogas that comes from our food waste. Uh, we heat our houses with what cannot be made into uh, biogas out of our garbage. We incinerate it, we heat our houses. So it's like a circular uh, uh, system and we have no landfills. We have not always been that climate conscious in the 70s. We used to dump all kinds of waste everywhere. But in the 90s, the government introduced a cost for emissions and there was a very strong protest from companies saying, this is not possible, we'll not survive. Well, not only did they survive, but they also increased the profits. And from 1990 to 2020, Swedish GDP increased by 71% and emissions fell by 26. <coughs> and um, the government uh, um, <coughs> would like us to be net zero carbon, uh, to have net zero carbon emissions by 2045. <coughs> oh, sorry. One thing that I wanted to touch upon is what we see happening. Let me take a lecker roll. <laughs> what we see happening in the north of Sweden. Um, the north of Sweden used to be our rust belt. It was a <clears throat> A region that was very heavy dependent on timber, iron ore, steel production. <coughs> it was a, a region that was suffering from brain drain, brain drain unemployment, and um, there was no future for the youth. Well, then they decided to embrace the new technology. Instead of clinging to the old technology, they decided that let's embrace the new technology. <clears throat> and <laughs> now this region has positioned itself as a leader in the booming <clears throat> renewable energy and high-tech industries. <clears throat> Let me just chew on this leckerol for a while. <laughs> Practice doing lots of things, and one of those includes having a sore throat. So take your time, Camilla. Mm, thank you. <coughs> a dry throat. So um, we now have the possibility of producing steel without carbon emissions in Sweden. You might have heard about hybrids. All around the world, steel is made with coal. This is how it's produced here in the US. This is how it's produced all around the world. If you can take out the steel <coughs> and use green hydrogen instead, you can produce steel without any CO2 emissions. 
and that's what's happening in uh, <clears throat> in Norland, um, in the north of Sweden. So you have the hybrid project, which is already up and running, and uh, they are producing this carbon-free steel, and this steel is already put into the Volvo cars. These cars are a little bit more costly, <coughs> but um, customers are prepared to pay a bit more because they feel good about driving a car without any, any CO2 emissions. There is already a sequel to H2 Green, to, to hybrid project, it's H2 Green Steel. They're also starting production of the fossil free steel. We also realize that we need green battery production, not only in Sweden, but in Europe. 95% of all car batteries are made in Asia. And we need to have that capacity in Europe. <laughs> so we have Norfolk, um, which is now in Skellefteå, in the north of Sweden, which is now producing green batteries for electric cars, and uh, is now developing a battery hub. There is not only production in, in, in Skellefteå, in the north of Sweden, but also around Gothenburg, <laughs> to supply Volvo. And they're also opening a battery factory in, in Germany. So um, I think this is very encouraging. I think we have a good story to tell here that if you do embrace uh, the new technology, then you have the possibility of creating jobs. And the north of Sweden is now become somewhat of a Klondike and people are moving in. The cities are expanding. And, um, and I think um, it's really encouraging. Um, <laughs> we're not only um, producing um, um, green steel and, and, um, and green batteries, um, we're also building houses out of mass timber. Uh, concrete is also a very polluting industry, the, con the concrete industry. And now we're building high rises made out of mass timber. Uh, and um, actually, I think 85% of all houses in Sweden are made by timber, but these are, are one family houses, but we're not building high rises out of mass timber. So I think there are some pretty interesting things going on. Uh, and uh, just uh, next week, a new initiative will be launched called the, called the Green Transition Initiative, where um, our embassy in Washington, together with the Energy Agency and our Agency for Innovation, is opening up an office to help Swedish companies come to the American market and, and, uh, and you know, together with the US, you know, find ways to also transform uh, operations here in the US so it can be more carbon neutral. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> I wanted to say a few words also about the situation in Europe uh, because uh, I think it's unavoidable. And, um, um, since uh, Russia invaded Ukraine on February 24th, the whole security policy situation in Europe changed. And Russia's aggression against Ukraine is unacceptable. And the Swedish government condemns the armed, Russian armed attack on Ukraine in the strongest possible terms. It's unprovoked, it's illegal, and it's unjustifiable. And Russia alone is responsible for the human suffering. Russia is uh, conducting the war in an increasingly brutal and indiscriminate way. And uh, from a Swedish point of view, we think that those responsible for the war crimes should also be held accountable. And I know ICC is already starting to look into that matter. But Russia's armed attack is more than an attack on Ukraine. It is an attack on every country's right to decide its own future. If Russia succeeds placing Ukraine under its supremacy, it opens up similar demands on other countries. Stockholm is just two hours away from Kiev if you go by airplane. And this is a neighboring country for us. Um, the Swedish government has decided 
in broad agreement with all the political parties to support the Ukrainian armed forces. And Sweden has not done anything like this since the Soviet Union attacked Finland in 1939. We have provided 5,000 shoulder-fired anti-tank weapons, uh, 5,000 body armor vests, 5,000 helmets, and just today the government decided to send another 5,000 shoulder-fired anti-tank weapons to Ukraine. The Ukrainian forces are fighting very bravely. We are also supporting, of course, Ukraine with humanitarian assistance. And we're also welcoming Ukrainian refugees to Sweden. Almost 3 million Ukrainians have already fled Ukraine. And um, under the EU's temporary protection directive, Ukrainian citizens can get immediate protection and temporary residence permits in all European countries. Around 15,000 Ukrainians have come to Sweden and it's been amazing to see how Swedish citizens have uh, opened up their summer houses, have rented buses going down to Poland to bring Swedish refugees, if, sorry, bring Ukrainian refugees to Sweden. Uh, people are really opening up uh, their homes and um, are welcoming the Ukrainian refugees. Uh, the estimation is that we'll have around 200,000 Ukrainian refugees before the summer in Sweden. Uh, that can sound like a lot, and it is a lot, but it's nothing compared to Poland. Poland has up to date received 2 million Ukrainian refugees. Uh, and um, most of these refugees want to stay close to the Ukrainian border. They do not want to go far away because they want to return as soon as they can. So Europe is really um, uh, showing great unity and, uh, and uh, is really together helping Ukraine in this, in this situation. <laughs> Um, so when the refugees come to Sweden, they can immediately get help with food and accommodation, and they have the right to work, and they have the right to seek basic care. They have the right to put the children to school, and they can get some kind of financial support. And the EU has been very unified in this whole process and has uh, agreed on unprecedented sanctions in response to the Russian aggression against Ukraine. Up to date, 877 individuals uh, are today, uh, ha we have imposed, the EU has imposed travel bans on 877 individuals and 62 entities. So these entities can be Russian banks, companies, media outlets such as Sputnik or Russia Today, and Russian banks can no longer use the SWIFT system. And I think it's been really encouraging to see how the EU or Europe and, and the US have gone hand in hand when it comes to these issues. Over 40 countries have partially or completely aligned with the, with the EU sanctions. And I, I think this is, this is testimony of the determination of the global community to, to re reject the invasion. Um, there is no immediate threat of an armed attack against Sweden, but the level of threat has increased and it cannot be ruled out that there will be an attack. So the Swedish armed forces uh, have been significantly strengthened and the prime minister decided on March 10th that the Swedish, uh, Sweden's defense spending will be increased. Um, we will uh, uh, we will be reaching 2% of our GDP that will be allocated for defense spending. And, and um, <clears throat> Uh, all parties having uh, agreed to this increase our defense spending. We will have more soldiers in our, in, in, in our conscript army and uh, my son actually is being drafted on, on May. We will see if, if he will be uh, accepted to be uh, in the Swedish army, but you know, it's, 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 it's a different situation now. Um, Russia is trying to dictate the security policy for Sweden and also for Finland saying that we should never join NATO, nor should we participate in exercises with NATO. 
And this for us is totally unacceptable. We are not members of NATO, but we are a close partner to NATO and um, seeking a status as major non-NATO ally. Um, and we do participate with, uh, in exercises with NATO on a regular basis. So our forces are totally inoperable with NATO forces. They're also totally inoperable with Finnish forces because we have a very close defense cooperation with Finland. And they're also interoperable with uh, British forces. Um, <clears throat> but we are not a member of NATO, so this is this is a is, is it's a it's a difficult situation. Um, but the Swedish government has made very clear that Sweden and every country, of course, has its right to choose its own security policy path. We determine our own foreign policy, our own security policy. International law must be respected and every state has the right to independently make its own security policy choices. Yeah, I think I will stop there um, and then I will be very happy to take any questions. Maybe I'll just sit down so that sure. we can yes. have. Please some join kind us. Of Take a break. I'll bring my lekker roll, I'll bring that, and I'll bring my tea. <laughs> we have all the ingredients for success. Thank you for the opening comments. You covered a lot. Sweden's definitely a country that punches above its weight, right? When we think about all of these companies that are there and the impact on the world and the history and the long relationship, I think sometimes we don't remember that um, about Sweden here in the United States. And you did a wonderful job framing that for us. And then of course, landing on the issue that's most present, I think on, any, on everyone's hearts and minds. So thank you. Yeah, Lawrence, I see your hand up. Can you wait for the microphone? Is this... oh, oh, I paused. I apologize. And then we need the microphone so the folks online can hear you. My name is Larry Goldberg. I'm a member of the World Affairs Council. Um, thank you for coming and visiting us and for your talk. Um, I've always been interested in the Swedish and the other Scandinavian countries' social systems. My perception is that you have uh, generous benefits that we only dream about in this country, like free health care and education and retirement pensions and re retirement at a fairly early age. And so in this country, uh, we have political leaders like Bernie Sanders advocating that we try to move closer to that kind of model. So I was wondering, how is that model doing in Sweden and the other Scandinavian countries? Is it still feasible and affordable? And are you are able to maintain it going forward? And would you venture an opinion as to whether it's a model that the United States could stand to follow? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think Bernie Sanders sometimes might, you know, um, picture Sweden as being paradise on earth, and he might not be totally correct. <laughs> <laughs> but I would say in general, uh, the social security system works very well. Um, uh, we, we have, as you were saying, we have free education, we have free health care. Uh, we have uh, a pension system that works fairly well, but we have been encouraged to also start with private savings since a few years back. Uh, it will be, you know, pensions will still be paid, but, but there is a strain on the system. Um, I think this system creates opportunities for all. Uh, it means that you don't have to have parents that start saving uh, you know, um, early on so that you can go to college or university. Everybody can go to uh, university in Sweden. The only thing you need to pay is your own cost of living and books. Everything else is free. It gives us a sense of uh, security, knowing that if we would get sick, we will get good health care. Swedish health care is up to a very high standard. Uh, and... Uh, um, <clears throat> I think, um, um, I mean, what he's always said is that we pay very high taxes. It was very interesting because somebody was making the comparison saying that actually, if you add everything that you pay in New York in form, in, in form of <laughs> different taxes that are added every day, uh, well, we get a lot for our taxes, whereas in New York, you get nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's completely true, uh, but um, 
I, I must say that I, uh, and you, you will have to fill in on it if you feel differently, but I would say that as a Swedish citizen, I feel that, you know, I pay a fair amount of taxes uh, and I know that I can count on the system. We have a very high level of trust in our government um, because we know that there is, there is a low level of corruption and embezzlement. I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but, uh, but we believe our politicians in every situation are trying to find the best possible solution for us. So uh, of course we can always like, uh, uh, you know, complain and, and you know, uh, no system is perfect, but it, on the whole, I would say the system works really well. Um, and it's not only Sweden, you were mentioning the Nordic countries and our systems are very similar. Uh, I see Annette nodding. So I, 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 I assume you agree with me. Uh, no, I, I think it, it's an advantage, uh, advantage to live in a society where you feel that you can start with nothing and you can actually um, you know, have access to free healthcare and, and free education. And if you just put your mind to it, you can really succeed. Um, we have a lot of talking about entrepreneurship. A lot of our new immigrants uh, are very strong entrepreneurs and, you know, thriving in that system. Um, yeah, Anna, please. Uh, just add one thing. That <clears throat> sometimes a problem with the rhetoric of Bernie Sanders. Uh, uh, sometimes the problem with the rhetoric of Bernie Sanders is that he calls Sweden and the Nordic countries socialists. And uh, just as Camilla said from the stage, Sweden is very much a capitalist country, but with this social democratic system. So I think that is also very important to sort of stress. Thank you. Yeah. We have our next question from a high school student, a future world leader. Perhaps we've got Jessica Spindler, a student from Jenkintown High School. Jessica? Hi, thank you, Lord. Thank you very much for being here, Consul General. So in February of 2022, the Swedish embassy launched the Climate Archive We Hear You in conjunction with Georgetown's Institute for Environment and Sustainability to combat climate change. However, yesterday on March 22nd, the Swedish government gave the approval for a British mining company to begin plans for a new iron ore mine um, in the northern region of the country. Why do you believe the Swedish government would give the permission for this mine, especially when indigenous peoples, UNESCO and UN experts are all very openly opposed to it over mounting environmental concerns in the region? Yeah, <clears throat> it's, uh, it's, a, it's a difficult, um, you know, debate whether, um, you know, I think, you know, mining is, is necessary. Um, not least nowadays, uh, all these rare earth minerals that we have, uh, also Sweden is rich in rare earth minerals. If we're gonna make it, uh, if we're gonna, if we're gonna <clears throat> really go green, uh, we will need all these rare earth minerals uh, to, uh, to be able to uh, transform our industry. I mean, just uh, talking about windmills, uh, there are a lot of rare earth minerals going into uh, into the windmills. Um, so I think that it is necessary to have mines um, and to go into mining and to uh, explore the natural resources we have. And I also think actually now we have seen with COVID and we've seen the breakdown of the value chains. I mean, we have to be somehow self-reliant uh, uh, in Europe. We cannot rely on importing everything from Asia. Uh, so I think, uh, and also now with the war going on, as we have to be self-reliant when it comes to energy. Uh, and we have to stop our dependence on Russia, Russian gas, Russian oil. Uh, and we, we have to look at what we have in our countries. I know that there has been uh, a, a debate and the indigenous Sami population are not happy about this mine, but I think you, know, you have to weigh uh, different uh, interests. And I think uh, that the Swedish government uh, have considered all uh, different uh, aspects of this. And 
I think the main objection from the Sami population is that will be really disturbing for the reindeers that are um, uh, feeding in that area. Uh, but I've also understood that there will be adaptations so that the reindeers can still uh, uh, be grazing in that area and not be disturbed too much. Got a question up front? Please wait for the microphone. Thank you. Hi, Mark Friedman. I'm also a member of the World Affairs Council. I'm just interested in the relationship between Sweden and Finland in terms of getting into NATO. I mean, Finland being right on the border, of course, of, of Russia, of whether they're going to go in, what do you think they'll go into NATO and, and what Sweden's position would be in that case? I'm just not sure what scenario you think might play out. Mm. Well, yeah, this is the big question, I think, at the moment. Um, and uh, and uh, um, it's being heavily debated. What I can say is that if Putin's intention was to uh, threaten the Swedish population and the Finnish population from even discussing a NATO option, I think he was totally wrong because support for NATO has increased in Finland from, was it 35% up to 63%. And in Sweden, support for NATO has increased from 33% up to 52%. Uh, whether we will join or not is still being very much debated. Um, and since Sweden and Finland have a very, very close defense uh, cooperation, I think it would be an advantage if we if we would join that we will do it that we would do it jointly. Um, I cannot. I I know that the Finns have what they call a NATO option, and they've had that for a number of years. Um, uh, and I, just from reading uh, um, um, in, in articles in the press, I've seen that uh, there seems to be. Uh, some kind of movement on, on uh, you know, in, in, in Finland on this issue, but I will not be able to say where they will, where they will end up. And I think this is uh, this is something, and I know because there is such close dialogue between the Swedish Prime Minister and the, and the Finnish Prime Minister and the Swedish Defence Minister and the Finnish Defence Minister on this issue that there will it will be coordinated um, and um, yeah keeping each other totally updated on, on what will be happening. We've got a question online from our Zoom guests. Haley will read that for us. We, we have a question from Rob Ray. Are there any Swedish universities that are actively cooperating with US colleges for exchange students and or joint research? Uh, yeah, I mean, most Swedish universities do have cooperation with American universities. Um, I will not be able to say exactly which universities, but all of our big universities, Uppsala, Lund, Karolinska, Sol 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 Solgrenska, um, Chalmers. Uh, yeah, I mean, we have a lot of Swedish students going to American universities. What we would like to have are more American students coming to Sweden. Uh, and I know that um, uh, the American Chamber of Commerce, together with um, uh, a number of Swedish universities, are trying to look into ways and in how that can be um, uh, increased, um, because uh, we would like more American students to find their way to Sweden, not only Swedish students find their way to American universities. More questions from the audience. All right, I've actually got uh, Jessica again in the back. And then Larry. So going off of the question, two questions back about the entrance into NATO for Finland and Sweden jointly. If you were, not you, but if the countries were to hypothetically join within the coming months or within the coming year, do you believe that Russia would feel cornered in the sense that they would eventually lash out more towards Ukraine because of the influence of the West coming closer to home? Um, well, we already see Russia lashing out at, U at Ukraine. And to be honest, from a strategic point of view, I don't think the war has been a success. Um, uh, 
uh, for Russia. Um, we don't know what Putin has in mind. Uh, we, um, we have seen that he's using indiscriminate force and um, weapons that um, create a lot of destruction. Um, and there is a, a huge suffering for the Ukrainian population. Um, I am not sure if Putin would direct his aggressions towards Ukraine. I think if Sweden and Finland would join, I think most likely he would, he would direct his aggression against Sweden and Finland. Um, <clears throat> uh, it's, it, it's impossible to say. Um, uh, everything is speculations, of course, uh, but there have been verbal threats uh, from President Putin saying that if Sweden and Finland would join, that there would be serious repercussions. We've got a question, another question online. So we have two questions um, with regards to refugees and migrants from Ukraine. Um, in what ways is Sweden working to integrate refugees and migrants into your society? Um, and I, I know you spoke a little bit about this in your opening remarks. Mm -hmm. um, the, the person is saying, um, as um, in, in what ways is this expanding the demographics uh, of the migrant population, Asian and African migrants are less integrated than European migrants, and how is Sweden addressing um, wider social integration? Okay, <clears throat> I'll start with the first question. I mean, the refugees from Ukraine just came um, the last couple of weeks, so I cannot say how well they will be integrated into Swedish society. What mm. I do know is that they have uh, uh, the possibility to work uh, from the outset. So it means that um, there will be job opportunities for Ukrainians coming to Sweden and <clears throat> there's a lot of talent in Ukraine. They have a lot of <clears throat> programmers, they have a lot of uh, engineers and I'm sure that uh, they can <clears throat> be ways to, uh, to uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, welcome them in Swedish companies because we're always looking for talent. Um, right now, I think the biggest issue is to try to get the Ukrainian children into Swedish schools and try to find Ukrainian language teachers uh, that can help the Ukrainian children, you know, in, in schools and try to understand um, the Swedish school system. But what I understood that Ukrainian and Swedish school systems are quite similar. So, um, yeah. Um, and then, yes, we do have quite a large number of refugees in Sweden. Um, uh, we have always been very generous uh, uh, and, and uh, in 2015 we we welcomed 163,000 people fleeing from um, uh, Daesh or ISIS um, and uh, um, yeah we have we have this history of being very generous and trying to do our best but I do think <coughs> we might have things to learn from the US you are this big melting pot, um, and uh, and uh, you know we could be more successful probably in integrating migrants into Swedish society. Um, uh, we do have some challenges, uh, but we're trying to do our best. Uh, so uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, we'll just keep our fingers crossed, and I think that we'll try to do our best for all. All refugees coming to Sweden, um, but we're not perfect. Larry, you had another question? Yes. Um, there was an article a few days ago in the New York Times about Sweden, perhaps you saw it, and the, I'm not sure I understand it fully, and maybe you could help explicate it for me better. It seemed to say that women in Sweden who are in the Me Too movement who wish to accuse men, prominent men, of having sexually harassed them cannot do so because 
under Swedish libel laws, they would be hit with um, defamation suits, regardless of whether the allegations can be proven or not. And they could be facing severe penalties. And so this has put a chill on the Me Too movement on feminism, I guess, in Sweden. Are you aware of that? And can you explain that better? Mm. Yes, this uh, article, yeah, it was uh, Sissi Valin. Um, uh, I'm aware of that article. Um, actually, uh, she, uh, uh, she can now publish her book. Uh, so the, um, um, the verdict was that, no, her book is not a defamation. She mentions um, people by name uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, um, it's the, the, they, the court decided that that was totally fine. Um, um, I would say uh, that, well, the Me Too movement was very strong in Sweden. Um, uh, and uh, uh, a lot of men were, were called out, uh, just like in the United States. I mean, mm -hmm. it all started with Weinstein. And mm -hmm. uh, I think it was very refreshing to see that uh, there was a debate about these issues. Um, as for Sissi Valin's personal case, um, uh, it's, 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 I, 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 I mean, she's speaking from a very personal point of view because she thought probably she was gonna lose in court and that she would not be able to publish her book. Now, uh, uh, she will be. Uh, I, would, I would not say it's a very big problem, um, but of course, I mean, uh, you cannot just, you know, uh, name and shame people without, you know, having, uh, you know, evidence for what you're doing. Uh, I don't think the situation is worse in Sweden than anywhere else. Um, and, uh, and I think that there are issues, you know, um, in a lot of countries when it comes to this. Um, uh, and I do hope that people continue, uh, you know, um, um, you know, push for, for a more gender equal world. Um, um, so, yeah, um, I think that's, I don't know if you want to add anything in that, um, because we, we read this article and we, yeah, we are aware of it, but as, as a matter of fact, she was proven right in court. So I think if the article would have been written a few days later, maybe she wouldn't have. <laughs> <laughs> precedent now that women can speak out or is it on a case by case basis? On a case by case basis. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. We've got another question that is up. On a lighter note, I would love to hear your thoughts on H&M and fashion, with H&M being such a first global leader with fast fashion with over 5,000 stores around the globe, mm. and also with them being a leader with their H&M foundation and sustainability, and I know that they've done a lot experimenting um, and using orange um, peel mm -hmm. and apple, apple peel, or orange yep. fiber from Italy. And just wanted to hear, is it as popular in Sweden as it is in the rest of the world and you know, some of the other mm. initiatives that they have on sustainability? Yeah. So uh, yes, <clears throat> H&M uh, is, is, uh, is in fast fashion, uh, uh, but, but they, just as other companies have realized that also the fashion industry is a very polluting industry. Um, um, <clears throat> and they've tried to do something about it. Uh, and, uh, and just as you mentioned, they are trying to use cork, they're trying to use orange peel, uh, um, or grapefruit peels to see if you can make like leather out of these products. I think it's really encouraging. Uh, uh, and, and they're also, uh, they also have a whole line of like eco-friendly uh, cotton, and actually they stood up very bravely when it came to uh, the Greater Cotton Initiative. Um, they said, we're not gonna buy Chinese cotton from Xinjiang because it's been with, with, produced with forced labor. Uh, and they were heavily punished for that. All the H&M the, uh, stores in China were closed and, and uh, um, uh, they, they stood by their decision. Uh, then China is not a major market for H&M, but of course China is a, is a big market. Uh, but, but most of, of, of uh, H&M sales are, are in, in Europe and, and in the US uh, and other parts of Asia. Uh, so I think H&M uh, are really 
you know, trying to do something about fast fashion and they're also recycling. So when you, if you've bought something from H&M and then it's torn or you don't like it anymore, you can actually go back to the store and then they will recycle it for you, which I think is very good. Um, we have to, tr to stop thinking about, you know, wearing something for like two or three times and then we'll just throw it away because there's so much water that goes into the, the production of clothes. So I think it would be nice if they would encourage also other major companies such as Zara uh, and uh, Mango and others to become more sustainable. Uh, so thank you for that question. And I've just read that they launched a rental program for men's suits. Oh, did they? Uh, okay. In Europe, they're testing in Europe. Oh, that's great. Yeah. No, I, rent and, and, and some other Swedish companies have done that as well. Uh, so you, instead of buying, you rent mm -hmm. like ski equipment, or um, in not ski equipment, I mean, um, what do you say? Uh, um, what do you wear when you go skiing? You might go skiing like once a year. Uh, and then instead of buying it, and then it will just sit in your wardrobe for a whole year, you can rent it for a month and you cut latest fashion and then you like you go back to the store and you give it back so i think that's really good things can be rented you don't always have to own it we've got one more question online Haley. um we have a question for from orfeo fiertos oh thank you for my classmate from lund <laughs> hi orfeo <laughs> um Thank you for a great event. Sweden has exported many cultural icons. Previous generations thought of ABBA and Pippi Longstocking as modern representations of Sweden. Who should Americans be paying attention to today? Are there cultural icons that you think somehow represent Sweden? Who should we listen to? Who should we read? Oh, who should we read? If I start with that, I mean, we just had a very interesting event in, in the residence in, in New York. Uh, two weeks ago with uh, uh, Jason Timbuktu Diakte. Uh, he wrote a book called The Drop of Midnight, which will go up on Harlem stage uh, on June 6. I think uh, that would that's worth reading, um, uh, definitely. Um, we also have a, a very interesting Swedish author in New York at the moment on a, uh, uh, on a grant. Uh, his name is Jonas Hassan Kimiri, uh, and he's also a very interesting writer. Um, so I would say, uh, yeah. And when it comes to uh, music, I might uh, ask Annette to say a few interesting Swedish artists because you are the music <laughs> <laughs> expert at the, at the consulate. What would you suggest, Annette? There's a microphone coming. But there is so much new music. And I mean, there is so much music out in the world that people don't know that there are Swedish uh, writers behind uh, for some of the biggest American stars. We have so many music producers behind their, uh, their music and also writers. But from Sweden, we have very many very strong female uh, artists right now that are big on the scene in, uh, in Europe now, and they are going to, Euro uh, to the US as well. Uh, and then I think that everybody should continue to listen to ABBA. <laughs> they actually today won the Swedish government's music export oh, yes. prize uh, for their new album and for other things. Uh, and then, of course, we had uh, the great artist Avicii, uh, which was huge on the international music scene, but who very sadly committed suicide. Uh, but so there is lots of great music being done. And mm. it's one of our biggest exports, actually, when it comes to the creative industry sector. Yeah. Max Martin is a very known uh, yeah. songwriter, and he's written for Katy Perry and Beyonce and uh, Taylor Swift and uh, Adele and you name it. Uh, mm -hmm. So, yeah, it is a big export. It's, it's uh, something that you might not know, but that now you know. <laughs> <laughs> you would ask my children, they would say, Steve from Minecraft. Oh, yes. <laughs> it depends on what age group you're talking to, but Minecraft is the, the video game du jour of young people, and Steve is the main guy, so that's their favorite Swede right okay. now. Okay, yeah. well, that's great, yeah. yeah. Video games is a big thing in Sweden, so Indeed. Minecraft and Battlefield, um, Candy Crush Saga, you have a number of these, you know, yeah. Sweden helped us through the pandemic with all their video games. <laughs> 
Well, on that note, the hour has gone by so quickly. Please join me in thanking our Council General tonight. What I'm taking away from this conversation is um, a reminder of how challenging it is to be a diplomat, right? We peppered her with questions about all different kinds of things, shifting gears, and you did it seamlessly. Well, we're in the middle of a security crisis that deeply affects Sweden, and she's been with us since about eight o'clock this morning, running all over Philadelphia, learning everything that she can about our beautiful city and region. So um, excellent work on the ground and excellent work here this evening. And we thank you for sharing your perspective so that we can help educate Philadelphia about what's going on around the world. And thank you all for being here online um, and in real life in 3D, as people are saying now, it's good to see all of you. Um, if you'd like to join us again on Monday, we've got the Ambassador of Estonia joining us here in Philadelphia on Monday evening. It's a joint event at the Racket Club. Of course, we'll be talking about the security situation, but also digital governance, cybersecurity, and the technology sector within the Baltics. Uh, on Tuesday, April 5th, we have a Council Conversation Club, which is a totally different format. It's a conversation club. Uh, supported by the Stan and Arlene Ginsberg Family Foundation in the Great Debate Series. And we're discussing, should museums return artifacts back to their home countries? Mm. Very controversial topic when we'll have some facilitators who work in this field to help us explore this conversation, which doesn't necessarily have a clear outcome. And most people are coming to it uh, with an open mind. On Wednesday, April 13th, we are very excited to host the former Prime Minister of Australia, Kevin Rudd. He will be talking about the dangers of a catastrophic conflict between the US and China. So we're taking a third party, a third country, an Australian perspective on the US-China relationship and the potential of conflict there, which feels ever more um, urgent to understand considering the way the world has shifted since February 24th. Much more to come, but I'll leave it at that. And thank you again for joining us this evening. And thank you to the Consul General of Sweden for joining us from New York. Have Thank a good you, night. Lauren.